everybody. Welcome back to But Why the Podcast. And today we're talking about his heiress, Michael Jordan. As always, I'm Kate. I'm here with Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And Matt. Hello. And our special guest, Nisha. Hey. Hi. Uh, n- <laughs> yes, hi. I forgot we were supposed to say hi to her. Like, we don't talk to her every day <laughs> when she's coming to guest on our podcast. Hi, Nisha. Hey, guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Um, why don't you tell everybody where you're from on the internets and why you're here to talk about Jordan with us? Um, okay, yeah. So if you, those of you who are not familiar with Kate's other show, Did You Have To? I'm her co-host over there where we get to talk about all things anime. I'm also part of the But Why Though podcast community and the geek community with, I'm a writer on the website where I cover a lot of gaming, manga, writing, and I co-host on the other podcasts. So here's what happens, where we get into all things entertainment. And yeah, I'm here because I'm a child of the 90s who grew up with Michael Jordan's name being very common around my household. Also, while I'm not from Chicago, as Matt will probably point out, I am one hour from it. <laughs> so I get to be their Chicago expert to talk about Michael Jordan. Adjacent. Adjacent. Hey, I would never say I'm the. Chi- I won't say I'm a Chicagoan because that pisses people off and it pisses me off. But I at least am. I am now ten minutes away now that I moved closer, so I can say I'm a Chicagoan. It's all that matters. Yes. <laughs> um. But yeah. So I obviously don't know anything about basketball that isn't the Spurs, as I showed in our NBA episode. So Matt will be leading this episode today. Yes, I will, because also as a child of the 90s, but not, and not quite Chicago adjacent, but um, I did see and watch Michael Jordan as a child. Um, so I guess for, t- to start our intro question, I wanted to go with, did you watch Jordan, I guess, like live in his prime, per se, and I guess, do you have any, like, fond memories or your, like, favorite, I guess, memory involving Michael Jordan? And I guess I'll start with adrian first so hopefully we get somewhere before i go to kate's like spurs <laughs> um i didn't watch jordan his prime mainly because i really didn't get into basketball until like the early 2000s um and the other fact that like through his first like two championships i wasn't even born yet uh so i didn't get to watch jordan's prime i remember when he used to play with the wizards uh, <laughs> that's about oh, yeah. when I started watching basketball. Dark times. Obviously, like, like growing up, like I know like who Jordan is and everything like that. But we just weren't like a big basketball family until like we had a TV and antennas, so we can watch games more often. So I don't really have any like real big memories involving Jordan, other than like the commercials, uh, the memes, and when he played on the Wizards, because I thought that was just the most hilarious three years season I've ever seen. And I hope no player ever has that kind of downward spiral like that again. Like, man, should just stayed away. Just, just well, the funny thing is, we'll probably talk about the Wizards. Because... And I know, and I know, like he like he was like an all star or whatever, but his numbers are pretty not great. <laughs> yeah, but he actually holds some records, which we'll kind of go from in those years, which is very weird. They're probably not the greatest of records, but you know, he does hold some records. Yeah, so like I don't have like any prime memories of George because I wasn't old enough and I just didn't pay attention enough. But the documentary is great, and his memes are great, and I love the conversations on who's the best basketball player of all time because it always gets fun. Yeah, <laughs> obviously for those of you who don't, fun. yeah, obviously before we get to the first one, for those of you why we're doing this episode, obviously um, we had the documentary The Last Dance finally, obviously we debuted earlier in the year and then finally got to Netflix for more people to see it. But also, we are doing the NBA bubble, which should be coming, which will probably just start it by the time this episode release, where we get to see, can we survive a pandemic while playing basketball? Um, so, yeah, so kind of Jordan been the talk for the summer with, while we've been sitting inside. And so now that we're getting on to figure we'd actually talk about him in our own way. So I guess from <laughs> that, we'll go to Kate. So... I don't know if I watched him in his prime because the only people we ever talked about were Spurs. <laughs> so <laughs> I like 
there's religion and then there's San Antonio Spurs fans. Like, that's <laughs> how that goes. I pretty much didn't know about anybody who wasn't a Spur for a long time. That includes when I watched Space Jam, I cared more about the other people from base, for basketball that were in the movie than Michael Jordan. Wow. That being wow. said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. I look, I was literally brainwashed to think that the Spurs are the greatest team of all time. I've learned the error of my ways, although Tim Duncan deserves a statue and so does David Robinson. Um, but my my best memories involving Jordan is it, it, it really is just Space Jam and how much like not necessarily because of Jordan, but like that was the first time that like did like we had about like four generations of my family sitting watching Space Jam together because basketball has always been huge in my family. Like I said, it's always been Spurs centric, but like I have pictures of me as like a baby, baby, baby in like Spurs gear and like everything like that. So for us, basketball was always something that was central. And so watching Space Jam with my uncles and my grandpa and my cousins and my second cousins like all in one room it was always an experience that was really great and we wouldn't have that without jordan so that like that for me is like i i didn't know much about him till i binged the last dance but i'm really i i have a lot of respect for him after that documentary and he brought my family together so so i will say the funny thing that you can also thank for because basically them blowing up that 98 team or the 99 team and him retiring was the only reason the Spurs probably won that title. And if not, yeah. So I remember having a conversation I remember the- about when I talk about funny conversations about who's the GOAT, I remember having a conversation with a diehard Spurs fan that Tim Duncan was the best basketball player of all time. And <laughs> I thought he was joking, but he like he adamantly believed that Tim Duncan is the best basketball player to ever live. That's how Spurs fans are. They're really crazy. <laughs> Tim Duncan is Y'all the cult. best man. To have ever played basketball, but he's not the best basketball player. I don't even know if that's a know, like, Okay, <laughs> anyways, we'll get away it. from that. Nisha, where do you got so maybe we can finally get somebody who actually I care about Michael Steve Jordan. Kerr. I got excited <laughs> when I saw Steve Kerr show up on, oh. on The Last Dance, and that was oh because oh. of the 98 Spurs. Thank you very much. And I know who Dennis Rodman was because of the Spurs. <laughs> Okay. I have a very I, I'm in a bubble, the NBA bubble. That's me, but it's at the Spurs. It's also so a Spurs dead bubble. With, Spurs are sound like the cult, but you know they are. Um. <laughs> no, they are. But guess what? We're an extremely diverse team, and they care about us, and that's why they deserve statues. But it's all gonna die once Pop's gone. It's already dead, so let's oh. keep moving. <laughs> um. So for me, I guess. Well, I, the other thing I probably should have mentioned is like I played basketball for like 18 years of my life so from like a little important yeah (laughs) it's not that I forgot but like yeah I played from when I was five to all through college so um basketball is a very huge part of my family's life my dad was my first coach and the way we bonded is the man literally would watch the Bulls games he would record them on VHS and he would watch them with us at night when my mom was at work working a night shift so obviously I don't remember that but we're convinced that's how he brainwashed us into all becoming basketball players me and my two other sisters (laughs) Um, but some of my favorite moments of basketball and Michael Jordan is spent with my dad because he would just like him giving his, you know, his analysis and he being my first, first coach, he's like, you see how Jordan does this? You see how he does that? So like some of those memories, just like watching those tapes when I got older, my dad are my favorite memories. But personally, like I saw Michael Jordan once in my whole entire life, like person to person. And I happened to be at a basketball tournament that his son was playing at. And all, like me and my teammates, we just kind of like stared like, is that Michael Jordan? And like my one teammate went actually went up to him and she was the only one brave enough to go ask him for an autograph. And she got it. But I got to like stare at Michael <laughs> Jordan from like 10 feet away because I'm like, I just see a very tall, black, bald, black man and a, and a hat and a Jordan hat. And I wasn't sure, but I got to see him. And that's it. <laughs> but he, seems, he just seems very cool and chill, but don't bother him when he's at his children's events. That's what I learned. Yes, that is probably fair. Um, yeah. obvi- obviously, I guess being the older person of this entire crew, um, I I guess I can do it with my first basketball story. Like I, my you know my mom was my first coach, and then she traded me away because she didn't want to coach me anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which apparently is not surprising to anybody on this podcast. But 
as far as like with Jordan, um, I did get to watch him in the prime. Obviously, I didn't really watch the beginning, like the first two titles and whatnot, because obviously still relatively young. But those that last three peat every summer, I'd end up going to like basically flying to my dad's, and that's what we watched all summer was the basketball playoffs, in which basically Jordan dominated the whole thing, and we sat there. And to be believe it or not, rooted against the Bulls winning every single time because it got old after a while. <laughs> uh, but no, as, but it's funny because like you hated it, but it was never one of those like. There's been teams like I hate the Cowboys. I hope you never win a single game the rest of your thing. But at least with Jordan Bulls, it never came like as much. You didn't want to win. You rooted for like the Reggie Millers and like the Gary Paytons and Sean Kemp's and Carl Malone. Well, I guess you can't really root for Carl Malone anymore. But you know John Stockton. But. Um, mm. You know, like, you rooted from them good because Jordan, you just knew, was so much better and it was just trying to root for an underdog the entire time. At no point did you ever think they were going to win. Right. Um, but no- well, oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was going to say, but yeah, as far as memories, like I said, I do remember watching all of these finals, watching the seasons. I remember when they set the record year, pretty sure it was a record year with the wins, they actually lost one of those games because the Hornets hit a half-court shot and that was one of their actual losses to lose. And it was like... That was about the only way they were losing that year. Mm-hmm. And I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say that like, and this is my opinion as like being a basketball fan. I just don't feel like sports, like basketball specifically, today is not played the same way it was played back then. Like Michael Jordan played when he was dang near dying on his feet and like pushed himself. And I just feel like when I look at today, like how we've seen the Golden State Warriors like win back to back. Like has it have they have they won a three peat yet or is have no they won they, they won two lost one then won another one okay yeah so I don't know I just I just my biggest criticism of the NBA is like no one plays as hard until they get to the playoffs but I just feel like watching Jordan play in off season was always like something for me because I felt in the Bulls like playing back then I felt like people actually went harder in the NBA now I just don't feel like people go as hard in the off season yeah um, like obviously in, like, regular season. Yeah, obviously, we we probably won't get into it too deep, but we will talk about, like, the height. The, like, Jordan's career and stuff in this year were definitely the peak of NBA time, and we mm-hmm. actually have the data to back that up at this point. <laughs> but I guess we'll kind of go in, get into it. Um, So I guess let's start this episode since we are hard to do it. We're kind of run down. I'm going to kind of just talk, give a brief summary, kind of like, I guess, about him a little bit, you know, his life, and then obviously kind of go into his career. Obviously, I'm not going to every single thing because we could be here for me just reading a list for an hour, and then we'll definitely get into some but why the those obviously as we've seen if we've seen the documentary that's 10 episodes of like an hour long we're just doing a podcast that's probably going to be an hour and change we're not going to fit everything in here um sorry not sorry um so we left something out it is what it is we'll come back at another time we can discuss the next one um michael jordan would be able to fit everything in yeah because if he didn't he'd take it personally yeah Um, so we get in here, uh, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. I just wanted to read his full name because it's funny because, like, how much that ended up being, like, an actual thing. Like, out of some people, like, you know, we have, like, the share, where it's one name, but for a lot of times when it comes to, like, things, people always say, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Um, he was born in 1963 to now. He's actually 57 years old, which is crazy when you think about the Hall of Fame NBA basketball player. I thought he was older. No, no. No, but I think that's just because, again, after a certain age, I just think people are dust. So that's fine. Okay, that that's that's fine. Um, obviously, we'll probably talk about mainly Hall of Fame basketball career, but also from what we don't know, he's also an NBA owner. Um, he basically owned the Charlotte quote unquote Bobcats that are now the Hornets, or were the Hornets, were the Bobcats, now the Hornets again. Uh, but yeah, he's and apparently he's also part uh, MB, um, MLB owner of the Miami Marlins. He was apparently part of the Derek Jeter group, who those people basically decided to come in and basically rob the Marlins and decimate their entire team. You suck, Derek Jeter, for killing that team even worse than they were. Um, but we won't go into that. Um, obviously, entrepreneur, philanthropist, businessman, you know, basically every single thing that we'll get into, like, he's done it at this point. Um, so kind of get into his basketball career, which is probably the majority of stuff. Went to North Carolina 90, from 81 to 84. Um, basically, he's notable for he won, he led him to the, t- uh, actually, you know, played up and w- won the national title his freshman year in 1982. He was ACC Player of the Year. Junior year, he was an All-American, 83 and 84. He was NCAA Player of the Year, I think, 83 and 84 as well, or co- collegiate AP year. Um, then he got drafted third overall by the Bulls in 1984, with the first pick being the Dream, Akeem Olajuwon. And then, obviously, the infamous pick of Sam Bowie going to Portland 
and we all know how that went. Um, as that's probably noticeable, probably the big thing. Obviously, this Reem is probably one of my favorite players of all time. Um, so people don't really discredit that pick because he he's also a Hall of Famer. That class that's also talked about a lot because um, I think it includes like Charles Barkley, John Stockton. Thing there, there's like four or five Hall of Famers in that class. So he, he was in a very stacked uh, draft class for anybody that's looked at stuff. Um, obviously, he played for the Chicago Bulls from 1985 to 93. Uh, he briefly retired from 94 and 95 to play baseball due to the death of his dad, or allegedly he was suspended with the conspiracy theory because he was gambling. I love that conspiracy theory. It's hilarious to me. Um, but, <clears throat> obvious, and so, and then comes back in 95 through 98 and plays. Um, we'll go through some of the accomplishments, but kind of then he moved to Adrian's period of the Washington Wizards from 2001 to 2003. He was actually an All-Star in 2002 and 2003. Um, we've learned the All-Star game is all about voting. That's about how that goes. So there. Uh, to kind of get into some of these accomplishments, which there's a lot, you know, six NBA championships, two three-peats, six finals MVPs, five MPP awards, you know, 14 NBA All-Star teams, nine all-defensive teams. He was, you know, Defensive Player of the Year, actually, in 1988, which people don't realize. Uh, NBA Rookie of the Year, 10 times scoring champ. You know, three-time steals leader, two-time slam dunk contest champ, which actually is relevant because nobody wants to do the slam dunk contest champ anymore. Now it's just a bunch of people who can jump and uh, probably don't really play basketball that well. Not saying they're necessarily bad players, but they're, it wasn't no, like it I mean, wasn't. You're, this, like, like there's a reason why like the top players don't aren't in that contest. <laughs> like, yeah. And they haven't been for a long time. Yeah, like, I think like, what was like the last like big player? What, Dwight Howard. Like, the last Vince yeah. Carter, or I guess Dwight Howard, but I, that was weird because I think people... I hated that one. I have my yeah, own I, I have my own issues with the slam dunk contest. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, like I said, it was... When Jordan won it, it was big. It went against a lot of top players. Like, the, you talk about the Clyde De- Drexler that thing. Obviously, even said it, it went kind of tradition for a while, you know, between Vince Carter, I guess technically Dwight Howard, and whatnot else. But, uh, yeah, it's not what it used to be anymore. <laughs> um... He was a three-time AP Player of the Year, two-time gold medal, you know, winner in 1984 and then 1992, part of the Dream Team, and then obviously inducted in the Hall of Fame in 2009. He's actually in the Hall of Fame twice, for obviously for the Olympics as well, part of the Dream Team, but, you know, NBA Hall of Fame. And think basketball, because basketball has the weird Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily weird, but basketball Hall of Fame counts everybody. So, like, even if you don't play in the NBA, you can still be in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Because um, I guess one of the fun random facts that I found with doing this is apparently there's the person who was drafted in like the seventh round or something, like Otis Smith or something, I think that's what his name is. He's also in the Hall of Fame, but he never played in the NBA. He just played in Portugal and Italy like his entire career. <laughs> and so he's wow. actually in the NBA, in the Hall of Fame, but it's just not like, like I said, it's not like what the football Hall of Fame is where it's just NFL players or stuff like that. The Basketball Hall of Fame includes the NBA plus all the international leagues and includes international play mm. and college and everything else. Okay. Anybody have any questions on all of that? Obviously, there's a lot of awards and accolades I left off. Um, anything over that before we kind of get into the but why those, which I want to spend a good bit of this episode talking about? Alrighty. Okay. So now getting into the but why those. Um, as I start all my things off, it's usually successful franchise. Obviously, he's not a franchise, even though he might as well be a franchise, but we'll go with successful person. And we'll kind of start with his net worth at this point. Um, as of 2020, he is worth $2.1 billion. <laughs> um, and just kind of a reminder, this is like he's literally just an NBA player turned businessman. He wasn't like a you know venture capitalist. He wasn't, you know, family wasn't rich and got, came up. He didn't get a million dollar loan. He's not the quote unquote self million billionaire from Chris Jenner who basically had an entire family and started. Kylie Jenner. Well, I don't care what her name is. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's obviously one of the most powerful celebrities in the world. I think he's ranked between like 18th and 20th, which apparently puts him higher than some of the top famous Chicago list people that we looked at earlier. Um, <laughs> um, he's also. Um, as of 2017, he has the highest career earnings, which means this includes like his investments and everything. But as far as like player money, um, what's it called? Endorsements, you know, uh, bonus money, prize money, book fees, you know, like uh, any type of commercials and everything, which is kind of crazy when we think about it. Um, obviously, this might change, but like the man didn't make $30 million a season until like his last two years in the league. 
because <laughs> people seem to forget like all the contracts we see nowadays didn't exist back then they were making like mm-hmm. five million and they're like oh my gosh you're breaking tough um people seem to forget like i i do the nfl thing of like just because i know it of like i think it was 1992 was when the nf the first millionaire for the nfl actually occurred <laughs> and now you see russell uh, now patrick mahomes makes 500 million uh so that's about how much has come in the last few years of sport, or last thir- I guess few decades of sports. Um, he's the first ever at first athlete to ever co- become a billionaire. Um, I believe LeBron nowadays is actually a billionaire as well. I could be wrong, or he's close. I have to look that up, but I know he's the first. Uh, he's the first uh, athlete to become a billionaire. Um, like I said, he's majority owner of the Char- uh, the Charlotte uh, Hornets. I think Glaston knew he was like ninety percent owner. I think he's been slowly buying more and more, but he did own. Um, everything. I said part owner of the Marlins. He owns so many investment businesses. Uh, we'll get into Nike, but obviously he has his Jordan brand and Nike, which is a big part of him. And the Jordan brand alone generates about $30 billion a year in sales for Nike. And the brand itself, not Nike, just Jordan brand is worth $10 billion. I believe that because when <laughs> yep. I worked at the mall, my second job was cleaning at Hollister at night. And so I'd leave at like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I would always know when new Jordans were going on sale because there'd be a line outside the goddamn mall at 3 a.m. with people with cots and crap lined up to get Jordans. Yeah. I did it once with my pants. <laughs> once. It was a family <laughs> event for you all? Well, we got there like 6 a.m., so I don't know if it's just because the mall wasn't, like, that bad. But when we got there, like, it was bad. <laughs> I still don't know how my mom managed to walk out of that mall with three pairs of Jordans for us. <laughs> I don't know how she did it, but That's she impressive. did it. Very, so for, I like, w- <laughs> three girls. <laughs> I will say, I think the reason the mall that I worked at was so bad was because it was the only mall in San Antonio at the time. Where you could get tax reimbursements, so all the Mexican nationals who would come up to shop would go to that mall specifically. And so whenever there was a big drop of, like, shoes and stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, that's a thing. I don't, I, don't know if that's a, I don't know if anybody outside Texas would get that that's a thing, but that's a thing, especially during, like, Holy Week. Yeah. Um, I said obviously this is just his overall like net worth and kind of stuff we'll kind of get into more of like how he did like you know as a in the NBA and stuff and kind of how that plays into his worth and kind of I guess as a person and whatnot Um, but no it's kind of amazing to me like just in general like how much he's built like I said he's just an athlete like it was never not saying he was you know dumb he was obviously probably the greatest athlete or whatever but you know like just what he's done as an athlete and probably just unheard of considering what we, yeah. you know, most people get it. You go, you play it your career, seems... you make your money, you, you retire, you maybe, you know, open a steakhouse and then you do whatever. That bitch got shade, though. Matt, leave Vince Young alone, man. You know how many athletes have, see, a bunch of them make fun of Vince Young. You know how many athletes own steakhouses? I'm like, seriously, sure go look at how many athletes own steakhouses. Huh? Wait, does Michael Jordan own a steakhouse? I'm pretty so, sure actually. there's a yes, there's a steakhouse. I'm pretty sure he, there's one here in Chicago. I'm pretty sure he does too. But no, like well, just go look up athletes and steakhouses. Athletes, like after they're tired, they just go own steakhouses. <laughs> he owns one. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jordan's steakhouse. So, okay, it's probably doing better than Vince Young's. It's fine. I mean, he's got <laughs> <Yes>. seven <laughs> locations, so yeah, <laughs> he's fine. Vince Young's also turned out to be a little racist. Oh, so. I mean, it was what it is. But as much as a Vince Young joke, like seriously, just look up athletes and steakhouses. They all retire. They all own a steakhouse. I don't so know why. So what I was gonna, what I was gonna say though, it seems like uh, so watching the Last Dance, obviously where the most of my information comes from, but also just listening to you retell this. I think about the different athletes now where, like, getting your own shoe is, like, that. that's the thing, right? Like, right. that's what you want to get. Mm-hmm. You want to start your brand. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting is that Michael Jordan really represents the blueprint for what being a brand is. Like, not just being an athlete, but being a brand. And mm-hmm. everything that goes along with that, which was, like, probably the most compelling thing about the documentary as well. As, as well. But, yeah, it's just crazy, and we'll go into it more when we talk more about, like, the endorsements and stuff, but, like, when I think about athletes who make more money now, it just seems like 
they're all replicating what they saw Jordan do from right. the start. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we'll get into, I guess, somehow just kind of touch on its NBA uh, kind of stuff he did for the NBA before we get back into more money. Because obviously, you know, he had to be good at the NBA to get some money. You know, that's how it works. Um, he's obviously considered kind of the goat of the NBA or the greatest of all time. You know, we went through all the awards, all the championships and everything else. He technically one of the most beloved basketball players of all time, both from Chicago fans and just basketball fans in general. Um, and the funny thing is, we talk about Magic and Bird popularizing the NBA in the nineteen in the, 19, in the early nineteen eighties and whatnot. But Jordan, technically, when he comes in the league, kind of takes us from them, especially towards the late eighties and into the early nineties, and then obviously leads the NBA basically through the entire nineties of reaching popularity. Um, he got the so. You know, basically, he got the game so popular in the 90s that despite everything the NBA done, it still hasn't even got back to that point of, like, viewership. And people don't seem to realize that of just, like, how many people, like, because we talk about how people watch a Super Bowl and that grows each year and it's crazy. We talk about, you know, some of these other games getting, like, stuff, you know, like, viewership, especially people with TV, accessibility to watching these things. Then the NBA has not even come remotely close to even coming, especially in terms like the championship wise, of what it was during the Jordan years. Like to put out like out of the top NBA Finals ratings is basically like viewership and like TV rating stuff. Jordan Bulls make up five of the top six of these. <laughs> um, the Lakers Celtics of '87 is not number five, and even like. To put the thing, it's funny because, like, even the worst of Jordan's finals, which I believe is the very first one or something, or one of the ones, I guess, I think in Portland or something that nobody cared about for the most part, um, is still miles ahead of anything we've even seen, like, post-Jordan thing. I think the next highest, like, post-Jordan ranking for finals and everything is, I think, one of the Lakers, the first of the Laker championships. But, like, we talked about kind of beginning, like, the you mentioned the Warriors and even, like, the Cavs and all their runs. They don't even come close to touching this. Like, I think Game 7 of the 2016 Finals, where obviously the Warriors blew the lead and everything else, and we came back from that, that's a very high-rated game. I think it's, like, the third-rated, highest-rated, like, NBA Final game. But as a series itself, it's still not even, not even probably in the top 20. And, like just crazy of like we think of all the stars we have today's game we think of how popular we say it is and everything i'm not saying it's not but like when you look at viewership especially like in the nba like especially during playoffs and you know finals and everything it's just not even close like i'm talking about like the bulls in 98 was like an 18 point something with like 32 million viewers versus like i think last year's finals was like an eight (laughs) and had a top like 11 million it's just crazy of to see of like how much like the NBA, not so fallen per se, but just like it's not quite the peak of what it was. Um, kind of the point we talk about, um, because I know I don't know if we mentioned this in a video episode, but we talk about like players, we talk about brand of stuff of like, you know, because like we've made people made the jokes of like basically how much money these players make things, you know, money these franchises. So basically, Michael Jordan retires and he comes back in 1995, and basically the NBA basically between the nba and like nike and all the sponsorship stuff you know like clients work from they basically he adds almost over a billion dollars in capital (laughs) just to the nba and all the clients with that he had been working with just from coming back out of retirement Mm -hmm. like that just and obviously like i said we see a billion dollars now we don't think much but this is like almost 30 years ago like i said the first millionaire football player has only has arrived like three years ago (laughs) So the first millionaire there and whatnot. And like I said, he, at the time in 95, I don't think Jordan's making more than even $4 million a year. So this is like the best athlete on the planet right now, and he's not even making more than $4 million. And that's just unheard of for stuff. And like how much money was being pumped that he made for the year, for the comp- for, I guess for the NBA and everybody else. Yeah. Which kind of lead to, like Kate said, into like the brands of basically Jordan walk slash run so that we could see Peyton Manning's big forehead for 20 years on TV of all the endorsements. <laughs> Why are you trying to be so mean? Like, <laughs> it's not mean when it's true. Who hurt it's you? It's not mean when it's true. <laughs> he's cha- he's channeling Michael Manning. <laughs> he's channeling Michael Jordan right now. Jesus. He was one of the most marketed sports figures of his time. It was basically not necessarily unheard of because not like Bird and, jo- and Magic didn't have their own thing. 
but for what all he did, like, during his playing career alone, like, we have Nike, which we'll get into later. He's on Coke commercials, Chevrolet commercials. He's doing Gatorade, McDonald's. He did Ballpark Franks, uh, Wheaties. We all remember him doing the Hanes commercials with the underwear. I, mean, I remember those. <laughs> yep. Um, obviously, it was so popular, we have the song Be Like Mike, which was sung by children in a commercial that eventually led to the 2002 movie, They're, Like Mike. Yeah, like Mike, yep. <laughs> where somebody found Michael Jordan's shoes, became a pro basketball uh, star. I hate that um, movie. Apparently, <laughs> it's funny because surprisingly he has a 57% on Rotten Tomatoes. I hate, I hate that movie. And I just Why hate the movie because Michael Jordan. What? Michael Jordan isn't in it. It was fun. No, Mike, Michael Jordan's not in it. Like they have almost every That's star it. from this time frame. Like Steve Francis, Vince Carter. Um, I think I, he's like, too busy playing. Of, he's too busy playing with the with the Wizards at that point. He can't. <laughs> he wasn't busy. He can't be bothered to go do like Mike with Bow Wow. Right, it's Bow Wow, right? Or is yeah, Little it, Romeo? Which one is it? It's a Little Bow Wow. <laughs> <laughs> little Bow Wow. Yeah, he's, he's too busy playing with a. He's too pl- busy playing basketball. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, you think you think the Wizards are gonna build him a little stadium so he can go film like Mike, like they did when he was doing uh, Space Jam? I don't. He think wasn't so. even supposed. He didn't even have to be playing in there. He didn't have to be like the other the other basketball players were there. I just wanted one cameo. I just wanted one cameo. And while we have some magical Michael Jordan shoes, sorry, <laughs> I hate that movie. Yeah, it, it it's an interesting thing. Um, obviously the Looney Tunes 1992 Super Bowl commercial, which literally led to the 1996 Space Jam movie that we've mentioned multiple times. He's obviously not the first athlete to star in movies, but it's weird because like, out of all the athletes that starred and stuff, I guess you'd have to go back to like things like people saying like, oh, I remember this movie. Like, I'm sure y'all can name other athletes that starred in movies, but could you really? OJ Simpson and Roots. I I mean, OJ and like Naked Gun, we get all that, but. But, he also in the Towering Inferno. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah obviously, and I'm thinking about James, Shazam. I don't know. <laughs> I can name the Shaq. She's in Shaq in a couple of movies. Yeah, he's in Shazam. Shazam. Or not Shazam. He's in Kazam. Cuz oh, Kazam. Yeah, Kazam. My bad. There we go. I also <laughs> loved Kazam. I loved Kazam. Mm-hmm. Up. Kazam's a good one. And Blue Chips. I think that one's actually about basketball. Blue Chips about uh, actual real life college basketball. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They pay a lot of people on the table. Um, basically at the time he was making, obviously, so whatever, but he's making almost 40 million a year in endorsements. And obviously, once again, where we're at, 90s and everything else, like through his career and career, that's just like crazy of how this works. Um, I don't know if you guys have any of your favorite Michael Jordan commercials or Be Like Mike stuff that you remember or whatnot else outside of. I remember seeing the Haynes commercial where he's on like the plane and he doesn't have the tag on the back of his shirt. And I was like, that's the most ingenious thing ever. Like, I hate tags on the back of my shirts. Like, how come all shirts don't come like that? I'm not going to lie. That really was ingenious. I do hate tags in the back of my shirt. I was like, wow, I do like this. This shirt right here I like because there is no tag on the back of the shirt. Um, Nisha, do you have any of your favorites? Did you get any local ones? Oh, local ones? I'm- no. Not that I can like think off from like my 90s kid brain. Um, I do love the Spike Lee one with, um, oh, with Spike uh, Mars Lee's. Blackman. Yeah, but Mars Blackman. Yeah. <laughs> I just, <laughs> that's one of my favorite ones. And I just don't, I don't know if it's just because I've, I saw that one the most and that's why I remember it the most, but like also the Bugs Bunny Super Bowl one. Um, but yeah, I don't think he ever did anything like specifically local to Chicago that I can't, at least I didn't see it. Okay. Cause I know like Kate's favorite uh, Spurs yeah, people the- would have some very bad local commercials. We have amazing local commercials, no, especially for H-E-B. It's amazing. The Spurs commercials for H-E-B deserve Emmys. They're terrible. Adrian, what were you saying? Oh, uh, I was... I'm, I mean, obviously, I don't remember this commercial, but I remember, like, watching this commercial at one point. I don't know. Like, maybe they were showed... You know how ESPN, so sometimes they show, like, old commercials? Yes. Uh, but the bird, when they're... Him and Jordan are playing uh, horse, horse and, yeah. like... They're, they're just oh, shooting yeah. from ridiculous, like from like the rafters or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I believe that's a McDonald's one, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. The other one I do know is a fire thing with Michael Jordan's mom, Dunks. Um, that one's pretty good. <laughs> when he's like, and it's just a man in a wig. <laughs> yep, it's just like he's like, and he's like talking to his mom, and he's like, I'll show you how it's done, son. And like, you see a man in a wig take off to be his mom dunking. That one's pretty. Yep. Uh, 80s commercials and early 90s commercials, I... great entertainment. So the main, so like I obviously really only knew like the Hanes ones that I saw a whole bunch, but 
Uh, actually, the was it? Didn't he do a commercial about failing? Uh, yeah, it was yeah. like it was. It's like a. I think it's a Nike one. Yes, um, uh, I know that Nike. Actually, what I was gonna say, Nike. I think did a set of those. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, those were pro. Those were actually ones that when it would come on, my dad would be like, "Watch this." I'm like, okay, <laughs> Nike's teaching me to persevere. <laughs> I uh, know okay? Nike did have a good set of those. But I remember D- Dwayne Wade did one of those, if I remember correctly. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think they still they still do really cool commercials. But those are the like that's probably the one that I remember, like actually like doing more than just like being a hilarious commercial, but like it like having a message behind it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Ultimately, it was to sell shoes, but <laughs> right. it has like a new meaning knowing about the last dance. Yeah. Um, obviously, we talk about all the endorsements, all the commercials, but as we all know, basically Nike and the Air Jordan and Jordan brand, and even we have Team Jordan and everything Jordan we want from Nike. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go into complete, we'll talk about some, but I'm not going to go the whole, like, you know, there's a lot here. But basically, a Jordan, funny thing is, obviously, we found out and kind of been known, but Jordan originally grew up with Adidas. He wanted to go with Adidas, his agent, David Falk. Uh, basically convinced him to go ahead with Nike. As he said, it was an upstart. Um, you know, basically Nike was known, known for tracks, for tracks uh, shoes at the time, you know. And apparently he called his parents and his mom said, go get on that damn plane and um, <laughs> go to, to check out this meeting with Nike. Um, Converse at the time, because he wanted to kind of possibly go with Converse, because believe it or not, Converse actually dominated the NBA. And it's funny because we don't necessarily... Aren't, talk- those, aren't those the shoes that break your ankles? Right. Yeah, but not at the time. <laughs> um, but the funny thing is, they didn't go with Converse because, well, believe it or not, Michael uh, Magic uh, Johnson and Larry Bird were actually signed, and that's who was actually representing um, Converse, and so they didn't know whether they were going to have enough space to fit in, like, a rookie and everything. And so, essentially, he went. Nike ended up offering him somewhere around 250000 which was, a time, it's, you know, like, insane for, like, a rookie deal. I think it ended up being, like, you know, way over, like, you know, they wanted a five-year, like, $5 million thing or something crazy over the time and whatnot else. Um, also in the deal, as you Kate had mentioned earlier, his own shoe line, you know, Air Jordan kind of thrown in there. Like, Nike, Nike offered him quite a bit for being a rookie and just a famous college basketball player. Um, mm. And it was crazy. Also, fun. Whoop. I was going to say, and now Nike owns Converse. Yeah, that's about how things go. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's funny because, like, you know, Nike's expectation for this deal was to sell about, you know, $3 million worth of Air Jordan by year four, you know, let's do it, good for rookie. And in reality, they sold $126 million basically in year one. <laughs> That's about how good this was. Uh, like I said, Air Jordans eventually became their own, so popular that Nike basically had to make its own branch and its own brand, obviously the Jordan brand that we said. Um, these literally were like some of the most popular stuff we talk about obviously waiting outside do everything but apparently obviously led to like the controversies of everything else of basically all the reports that like you know basically people getting robbed the beating over shoes we see all the other stuff that happened i mean apparently in 1988 even some schools basically banned jordan due to basically people robbing other people um obviously i've never yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah. No, we weren't allowed to. When I was in Catholic school, we weren't allowed to wear Jordans. Yeah, because basically yeah. they were a lot of people getting robbed, beat up. Uh, apparently, one kid was murdered at one time. That caused Wait, a big you thing. Cut out. I said apparently at one time there was a kid that was murdered over Jordans at one time, oh, like damn. a fifteen-year-old. That was in the wow. news. Like, um, I said it's just been. Like I said these all led to obviously cultural studies of like on Air Jordans and the Jordan brand of like a sign of st- like status, fashion, mm-hmm. and how intertwined between you know just in general. It... Uh, what question? Yes, because this I'm not necessarily I'm not versed in this, but because I and I think Adidas may be the answer, but doesn't Air Jordans kind of really like start this like streetwear like brand so far as like athletic to street? Um, I don't know necessarily about that, but I do know, like, the shoes were not necessarily, as much as they were designed, like, to start off with, like, Air Jordans were designed to be Michael Jordan shoes he wore during playing basketball. And then they yeah. kind of went really to the public, and then they've kind of turned into kind of like a street, like, wearing, not necessarily pure basketball shoe. I don't know if that's the first and how they came, but obviously it ended up being by far the pop- most popular. <laughs> it's definitely the first one I can think of, because, like, to your yeah. point, it's like Adidas, like the classic Adidas is definitely something you would not play in, cla- in classic Adidas. Like right. you would play sports in those because you're going to break your ankle and your foot. But like 
Air Jordans were meant to like actually play in, but then like it's kind of like they shifted from like, ooh, you can play with these on the basketball court. But then my mom would like, you go wear these only on Sunday and when it's not raining outside and like to church and somewhere yep. special. So I Googled it. Uh, so streetwear, as we know as a concept, began in the 70s and 80s with uh, in New York as a blend of hip-hop culture and surf culture from L.A. Mm -hmm. And then in the, and that was pretty much what dominated it, which Adidas comes in. And then in the 90s, you have the beginning of bringing other elements outside of just hip-hop and and skateboarding, which was kept coming at this point, which uh, started with the Chicago Bulls, which started with caps, jackets, and then ultimately Michael Jordan's shoes, which then led to everything else. Well, there we go. Interesting. Yeah, like I said, obviously, I know, like, the Air Jordan stuff, like I said, obviously, it's a close thing, and there's a lot that goes in there. Like I said, they did cultural studies over all this stuff, and, like, Jordan's a day. Like, kind of like how you mentioned, Nisha, like, people literally buy these shoes not even to wear them anymore. They just buy them to collect them. They're like buying statues. <laughs> My sisters um, have a very big Jordan collection. I probably should have sent a picture to y'all so y'all could have seen but it's massive. Cool. Yeah, like one of my friends has like that. He pretty much had he buys Jordans almost every single year he can. He's been collecting them since I've known him since high school. And I'm like, I'm like wow. Like I, he just has walls of shoes. And I'm like, wow, this is mm -hmm. crazy. And then like I said, even then of like you said, you wear them nicely to church or just like only a nice occasion. Like they're literally they're supposed to be like basketball, almost athletic shoes, but they're literally dress shoes in a sense. Yeah. I can say I've never played basketball in a pair of Jordans, mainly because they hurt your feet like hell to play in, but they look nice <laughs> on your feet to wear. But, again, never have, like, actually seriously played in a pair of, like, Jordans that you plan to wear with an outfit. <laughs> um, but, yeah, obviously, like I said, growing up, these things grew. They were super popular. They did whatever. And then, like I said, they apparently were banned in schools for a while just because of how much stuff happened around them. Um, obviously, we get the Jumpman silhouette, which was the logo that we all know of Jordan kind of jumping and everything else kind of follow there. Um, we always we get Jordan brand, which is, like I said, the kind of the literary subset of just literally his own subset of Nike that represents. The funny thing is, like, it went from, like, his own shoe line and obviously caps and everything to literally they represent athletes. And as much as they represent NBA athletes, like, they rep represent athletes from everywhere. Like, soccer players, like, um, <laughs> soccer players, football players, baseball players, you know. Um, mm -hmm. They represent uh, just everything in general, you know, just players from all around, just definitely athletes in general. And, like, this is actually kind of a big deal um, for p players. Um, people, especially I know we talk about like a new generation of players and everything coming up to try to be like Michael Jordan and everything and stuff. Like people coming up, they want the shoe deals and they want, and even much they want a shoe deal, they want to be on Team Jordan or with the Jordan brand. And that was mm -hmm. kind of how they are. And it's crazy that despite all of these years, I'm not saying bad thing, but like they're still on top. We haven't had another athlete come in and make their own stuff. Like obviously we had Under Armour who's now like broke. <laughs> at this point right <laughs> adidas and everything they have and converse obviously now gets owned by nike but you know like mm -hmm. just how much athletes rely or just whether they rely or just want to go be part of that jordan brand is crazy to see right. because like shaq had his own shoe and you yes. know no shade he made them affordable so everyone can have them but nobody went rushing hey, around no one stole shacks. my shacks no one no <laughs> one right. stole my shacks school. either i watched school just fine <laughs> <laughs> no problems. <laughs> no, but it's like, yeah, it's just like I remember when Shaq came out with his line. I don't know if that's still a thing. That probably went under. Like I have never seen a pair of Shaqs to this Shaq day. Shaq had shoes. They, yeah, they're ugly. See? I hated them. They were ugly. They, they were, were like ugly a mix looking. between or Jordan and like Air Force Ones, and they were oh! bad. Yeah, they're ugly. See, they're ugly. They're, they're, they're ugly. But yeah, I think Dwayne. I think Dwight Dwayne Wade has a pair has shoes. LeBron has shoes, but I can't think of anybody else who has like a, a shoe I know, brand like Jordan. I, I know Seth Curry had it online, and they were just called the Dad oh, Brand because yeah. <laughs> they were they were hideous. Ugh, so bad. <laughs> they tried yeah, so those hard. Are Shaq shoes. Yeah, Shaq had shoes. I remember those. I remember people when we played, and I you know obviously grew up playing basketball and stuff. People were like you can get some Shaq shoes. Like no, I'm good. I mean, we See, even why had like the, why, why are everybody making fun of Steph Curry shoes? These look cool. Which ones are they? Are those the Dad ones? The ones you're playing or the ones? 
I don't, I don't Steph know. Curry came out with some mowing the lawn shoes. They were straight, like, almost all white, and they looked like somebody that... Oh, I found them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah. yeah. Do they hire professional brand people to do this, or do they yes, just go, so, I like this? No, um, so, I don't know about, like, obviously these other brands, but, like, the Jordan brand hire, like, professional artists and everything to work with people... To do this stuff, it's a huge deal in like artistry and everything else. Obviously, I didn't put a lot in that show notes about that, but no, it is apparently a huge deal of like who, how they hire and who they hire to work with designs of their shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, we get some of sorry, the I just want to. <laughs> I wanted to add to what you said about the players, like is like it being an honor because like I remember when Maya Moore, so she's a she's in the WNBA. She was like the first female athlete to be brought onto the Jordan brand. So like. I tried to get a pair of her shoes, and those sold, like, real fast. But it's, like, it's a thing if you can get brought in on the Jordan brand and you can get, like, a line or, like, a shoe. Yeah, it's it's crazy, of like, what it's come out to. Like I said, I guess for me, the biggest thing, because I knew it was always an NBA thing, for sure. And obviously, Maya Moore played, you know, WNBA. But I guess when I po- looked up the list of just seeing how it's evolved, like I said, to baseball, to football, to soccer, to international sports of just, like, mm-hmm. wow. They represent a lot of athletes and a lot of, like, just athletes. I mean, I didn't even know just because of, like, you know, playing where they were. Which kind of leads, I guess, to the to, to the next part, I guess, before with the Jordan brand of, like, they started branching out the last few years outside of basketball. Um, as of 2016, they're literally the sole equipment provider of the University of Michigan. And so, like I said, this is Jordan brand. This isn't just, like, really, like, Nike. This is, like, Jordan brand. And, like I said, um, as of 2018, they do North Carolina, OU and University of Florida, and that's their football programs. Like I said, not even doing basketball. And then, obviously, PSG, for those of you that know soccer. Uh, uh, apparently not. Okay, anyways. Um, one of the largest, uh, biggest, and most uh, richest soccer clubs in the world. Not in America. Yeah. This is America, Matt. My bad. Um, basically, they have... kind of football. Yeah. They had their jump, uh, Jumpman logo kit, you know, in 2018. I also realized that Jordan Brand represents, like, international teams and stuff. Um, That's cool. Like, actual international soccer teams. Like, they supply their equipment. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're doing national teams these days? And it's just crazy of, like, how much this Jordan Brand has kind of broken out and done stuff. And I guess to kind of end with Nike, of, like, he changed Nike. He kind of not necessarily built Nike, but he kind of built Nike for the most part. And we talk about all the stuff he did in the NBA and changed and everything else. He probably did more for shoes and bath and Nike than he probably did for the NBA, and it's crazy. Yeah. And then, kind of for some perspective, we talked about Jordan retiring in two thousand three, um, and twenty nineteen. Jordan made one hundred and thirty million dollars just from his Nike deal alone. One, Damn. he's been retired for about you know seventeen years almost at this time. And two, the next closest person was LeBron James with thirty two million. And then Kevin Durant round out the third place with twenty six million. So Michael Jordan, who's been retired for seventeen years, made four times the amount of money of LeBron James on shoes in twenty nineteen. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just crazy of what mm-hmm. he's done. Yeah, I also think too, or not. I also think, but just one of the things that I really took away from the, watching the documentary and especially hearing like Jordan talk, um, there was a line he said. Uh, where he was essentially saying if he could do anything over it, he wouldn't be a role model or anything. And so I think, like, a lot of the pressure he had of, like, maintaining a perfect image and being this perfect person and, like, not being able to fail, like, yes, it was because, like, people looked up to him because of the sports, but also because he had these endorsements and he was essentially literally in everybody's home. And, it like, essentially, like, whether you think about it like this or not, when you look at our consumer practices as, like, ritualistic pieces, so, like, what I choose to consume, what I choose to wear, what I choose to spend my money on, I am then trying to buy into a piece of that identity. It makes you... it. <laughs> the sad thing about it is it makes you closer to that person, which then lets that... It, which It doesn't really, but the way you, you, picture, you picture it is like, oh, I'm wearing Jordan shoes. I'm going to be like Mike. Because I have, I have a pair of Jordans. And that, like, puts, like, unsur- like, unrelenting pressure on somebody 
like of where you have to hit and so like just listening to you detail how much he's not only responsible for basketball stuff but he's also responsible for a company just kind of like really solidifies like how much was on that man's shoulders yeah like i couldn't imagine like I said because i mean he clearly probably knows like you know a kid was murdered over his shoes <laughs> And yeah. just seeing that stuff, like, I mean, obviously, I don't know how 1988 and everything, 89, 90s and what else, but, like, just seeing some of that stuff of, like, I mean, that's, can you imagine somebody got murdered somebody over a But Why Though t-shirt? Obviously not, because we're not that famous or anything. But still, like, just the amount of, like, oh, wow, like, what is going on? This is insane. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's done a lot of cool stuff, a lot of amazing things. Obviously, it's had its own back, uh, you know. Um, opposite effects on some things and whatnot else but yeah um i guess before we get into the last part does anybody have anything else on nike at all because that i know that's a huge part that people like it's, I mean, jordan and nike almost are synonymous today yeah i mean i think of them as the same even with my minimal knowledge of jordan i have just always known the two go hand in hand yeah i think nike basically owes everything to jordan i like to where it is today i feel like without jordan nike would have like still made a lot of money but i feel like nike knows it owes a lot to michael jordan yeah yeah that's crazy um obviously we talked about the hall of the highs and all the other stuff but obviously nobody is perfect and especially when you're on top of things so we'll kind of get into it i guess the last but why though i'm probably the most of the jordan issues um kind of want to start this out with um as we've learned obviously we talked about the documentary but also there's been plenty of books written about michael jordan both with his consent and without his consent <laughs> um he doesn't he Mark, doesn't, i i learned that he doesn't talk to sports illustrated anymore because of the <laughs> not with his consent thing uh yeah um <laughs> <laughs> yeah um obviously mark uh vincil i think that's how you pronounce his last name vincil um he basically helped uh basically with co-write i guess with michael jordan and basically four books about his life career and stuff obviously rare air michael jordan 1990 on michael and michael 93 in 1993 i can't accept not trying michael jordan on the pursuit of excellence 1994 for the love of the game my story 1998 not the kevin costner movie apparently that's the first thing i thought of uh, Driven from Within, 2005, those are all kind of books written. I think probably made a few other authors, but basically Mark Vassil and then Jordan worked on pretty much all of these. And then we have the famous The Jordan Rules, written by Sam Smith from 1992. Yes. I would just, just as an, a, a small little fun fact to the last section, I did go to the Nike website, and up top it has the Nike logo, the Nike logo, the Jordan logo, and the Converse logo. As the three things for you to navigate through. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, obviously, they that. have the we have the Jordan rules, um, written by Sam Smith in 1992. Um, it was said to paint Jordan in a bad light. Obviously, this was one of the books written kind of without his consent, for sure. Um, I do remember this as kind of like when playing years. I do remember all this like stuff between coming out. Obviously, I'm still, like, a kid and everything, but, like, especially as I got older, and because much of this was written in 92, this kind of played on, maybe not throughout his whole career, but for quite a bit in his career, and so I remember this stuff, maybe not quite, you know, you know, off the top of my head, I've never read the book, but, you know, seeing on Sports Center and seeing some of the reports, especially as you watch other types, because, I mean, obviously, The Last Dance, 2020, the big documentary we're all t we're referencing, but, you know, there was other reports and other types of stuff that have come out, like I said, t not talking with Sports Illustrated, and everything else about like him and some of these like i guess you know issues and how it painted him and everything else um obviously the last dance the fun thing about the last dance was it was majority filmed in 1998 but it was never released because jordan went consent consent to the footage and then in 2020 um the fun thing is i like to think about everybody said this was the year LeBron was finally getting to the point where people were discussing his legacy, and Jordan said, I don't like you having the spotlight. I'm fine. Let's release this documentary um, to show you all how it really done. Um, obviously, <laughs> you can take what you want, but that's what all... That's, that's so, cool. wait. So, so, when you say a lot of this was sh shot in 1998, is that why there's so many, uh, like, them giving Jordan, like, an iPad to watch a video on, and then, like, them yes. recording his... So, like, so basically what they did is they filmed, they filmed and got this whole documentary in, at the end of the 1998 season. So it was supposed to be, like, because they knew Jordan was retiring, so they were going to do Last Dance, you know, Jordan's Last Dance 1998 season, because it was already rumored he was probably going to retire after the year anyways. And so 
Last Dance, 1998, they filmed his career and stuff, and then he never consented to releasing the footage. And so finally in 2020, he said, LeBron got too much press this year, and he couldn't allow that to happen. <laughs> and so, especially with COVID, um, he took it personally, okay? <laughs> he took it personally. <laughs> um, but no, apparently, and so basically what they did is they finally decided, hey, let's make this documentary. So they started making it. And that's why you see them, like, with some of the people, players who are, like, all of a sudden old now. And, like, the commentary and, like, the iPad. Because they're actually showing and talking with them. Because actually a cool way they did it. So a lot of these episodes were either not really filmed, almost not really quite filmed live, but almost kind of in a live sense. And so, like, this yeah. is generally them showing footage from 1998 and Jordan laughing, ah, that dumbass, you know. That like, that's... explains so much. Because so many people are like, oh, you really said that? Like... Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That's why it probably turns out even better because it's literally this documentary that's been sitting there for over 20 years and they finally release it, but they bring everybody right. back now they're 20 years later and you find out they still don't like each other or something else or they give commentary of what that's actually going on in this year yeah. and stuff. And so it's, I think they did a great job. Obviously, I've not watched the whole thing, but obviously seeing stuff because obviously I haven't watched the whole thing. Like I knew all this because I remember growing up with this and I remember just watching a bunch of sports and following all this. So especially when we get to some of this other stuff, you know, thing I already knew. Like Kate's like, "Well, I do." I was like, "I, knew, I remember the Jordan Rule book." You know, I remember, uh, you know, some of the bad stuff. I I remember right. the allegation stuff. But um, but anyways, yeah, watching them do the commentary along with the footage, I think does it in a very good job of what we see in the documentary. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really powerful documentary in in my opinion because I mean, and I'd say it as somebody who like doesn't outside. <laughs> I watched 10 episodes of somebody who wasn't a spur. That is, like, that <laughs> to tell you how good it is. But, like, seriously, I have no real connection to basketball, especially when it's not, like, the specific people I grew up with and especially when it's out of the context of, like, my family because I just never built that kind of affinity to it. Um, mm. And so watching it, it was a way where I – I felt like I understood the impact more because like I always knew that Jordan was important and I always knew that Jordan was good, but I had never really understood the impact on the other players, the impact on the league itself and just also like his tenacity throughout all of it. And so I felt like the last dance, as much as I think like there are parts of it that I think will paint that that some people see as painting him in a bad light. I actually like earned a lot more respect watching the series than anything else that I, I didn't have because I guess it's really easy when you have larger of like figures, especially in athletics, to just be like, Oh yeah, that's a legendary person. That's it. I don't think much of but I definitely think watching The Last Dance does a lot to really pull down the curtain on everything. And not even just for Jordan, for, like, the other guys there, too. Like, I learned a lot about Rodman that I had no idea of because I just saw him as the dude with the crazy hair, which he still is. But, like, I learned, like, I learned more and more past than what we what we get or got to see, like, just through, I, I don't know, like, celebrity trash TV, like, the, the rumors right. we get, the, 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 the stories we get the memories our parents have because like i mean mm -hmm. my first basketball memory is 98 and the spurs but like this show that there's like literally so much more than that kate but mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i i really like the documentary like a hell of a i did too like and i say that as like growing up and watching jordan play and then like having all those moments with my dad watching like old vhs and stuff and playing even after he retired it's just i've always had a respect for him but the documentary definitely made ha like makes me have even more respect because now I'm older and I can appreciate it on another level because I don't think me at six years old realized who I was watching <laughs> like at the time I just knew that Michael Jordan was one of the best players ever but like now yeah. that I'm older and you get all this insight as they're older in the documentary it's like wow he's really amazing and like he's human like he's <laughs> he's actually human he's he had his own struggles and he had his own stuff that he had to deal with Adrian, did you watch any documentary or anything? Uh, yeah, I've watched all the documentary, but I'm, I'm in your boat, Matt, where, like, I mean, I might not have watched Jordan, but I'm also, like, a big fan of sports. So, like, I knew a lot of the stuff that was going on, especially with, like, I know, like, and the same thing with, like, Rodman. Like, I knew Rodman was crazy. I know Scotty, I knew Scotty Pimpin was, like, the reason why Jordan has some of these championships, that people don't talk about that a whole lot. Uh, but, yeah, the documentary is great. 
Yeah. Oh, it's, it's like, done really well, too. I love the way that like they go back and forth. I think it's like a really underrated part of that and how it mm-hmm. kind of all just comes together in that 1998 season. I think if like you're a fan of sports or if you just want to know more about Michael Jordan as being like the GOAT, definitely worth a watch. For sure. Yeah, no, but obviously I know, you know, like watching this and I think just the way they did it of everything of just like kind of this half live stuff where you get this unfilteredness, like people drop the F-bombs and people like just lose their mind. Oh my gosh, they just said the F word on ESPN. What is going on? And I'm like, no, that, that's great. I mean, and like I said, you see all this stuff and I think that's what makes it good because you get that like sense of like that real sense of thing. It doesn't seem like this cookie cutter, like, you know, interview with some broad questions, you know, Jordan talks a lot of shit in this documentary and it's kind of funny 40 years later or 30 years yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, Isaiah Thomas bit is hilarious. I love the pet. Uh, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I still hate that guy. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's great. And like I said, because at the end of the day, I mean, that's probably what people liked Michael Jordan because he just kind of didn't shy away from doing stuff. Which I guess going from there, we can kind of go with some of the stuff into the documentary. It kind of, like I said, paints him in the light. Obviously, growing up, he had a lot of po- like political issues. Which you kind of talked, Kate kind of touched on a little bit, but like he has the famous thing of Republicans buy sneakers too, um, which obviously Jordan had a long stance of staying out of political commentary over his career. He's basically been criticized many years about it and not using his wealth to the full extent or the power to help people, especially black people. Um, obviously, the Republicans buy sneakers. His mom wanted him to endorse a political candidate. He decided he didn't. Want, he wanted to stay out of it. Apparently, he just sent a donation over, but he never made a statement about it. Um, like I said, I know we, he, Kate said he, you know, he talks about never want, never saw himself as a role model. Oh, no, no, no. He, no, he, his specific words in the documentary are, I wish I hadn't been. So he saw himself as one because he knew that that's how people looked up to him. But he specifically said, I wish I had not been a role model. Just gotta make but, that clear. My bad. My bad. <laughs> okay. Depending on you are. Um, obviously, um, I do remember this while this stuff happening King, but obviously I don't go here, I guess. <laughs> stuff like I just athletes coming in sports of athletes and being in political commentary or whatever you want to call it, you know, that's been in sports forever. But I do know growing up it was kind of a weird thing with Jordan because it was always like a big thing that was brought up, but he obviously never made a statement to where like Jordan making a generic like brand statement is a huge deal. Not because, just because, not, it could say whatever, but the fact that he spoke, especially for older people, of like, oh, he never talks on this stuff. So if he came out and said generic statement, um, people are like, oh my gosh, it just took thing, even if it doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if anybody was, remembers the big thing with the Republican buy sneakers ordeal. I remember growing up and seeing it. Yeah, I probably didn't even know what a Republican was at that age. So it probably like, <laughs> right over my head. But, like, I don't know. I feel like I've always heard, like, just from, like, my family, like, people in my family would always complain, like, he's not doing enough for the black community or he's not doing this and he does this. Like, I do remember the gambling stuff and I do remember, like, people talk about him smoking and, like, him, like, he could have done more, like, around my family. And I always just feel like that man just playing basketball. Let him live. But as I get older, I just feel like it's more complicated than that when you're that famous and that influential in that in that scene. So like I do, I did appreciate that like when he said that he wished he had never been a role a role model because at least he acknowledges that. If you're getting your political views from an athlete. You something's wrong. Something's that too. real wrong with the way that you I live mean, your life. Yeah, it's not wrong. I mean, like I said, that's been weird. Obviously, I see as we get more and more and then the state of the world and everything of like stuff being kind of blended over. Like sports has always played a role whether people like it or not. But right. it was, with Jordan, it was always weird. Because like I said, because you go from like I said, we talked about like the Olympics and Muhammad Ali and then even in the 80s and stuff, stuff. And then you get to Jordan and it's literally nothing. Right. And, and everything else. And then like I said, obviously, we move on to other places. Um. Like, people don't even realize, like, when they talk, we talk about the Anthem stuff, like, because we're like, oh, well, this, uh, no, that's actually in the CBA because somebody in the 1995 refused to stand for the Anthem, and they literally had to spend fine, and they wrote that within the collective bargaining agreement for the NBA a long, long time ago, um, and everything else. And that was, like, when Jordan was playing. 
it's just it was weird. Um, but obviously, despite all this, whether done or not, didn't do enough. Obviously, people have their own opinions and how they feel about things. He has done a lot of like donating to various charities and other thing. He's done the Michael Jordan charity golf tournament, I think, for like 12, 14 years or something like that. I don't even know how many, how long the thing's been going on. Things ran almost the whole entire two thousands mm. plus. It's it's at least fifteen years, if not longer. Um, obviously, after in that wizard season, he donated his entire salary of that two thousand one season to the nine eleven relief fund. So he played without a uh, salary for the entire season. Um, obviously, for the paying attention, he ended up he came out with the Black Lives Matter statement, basically saying that Jordan Brand donating ten a hundred million dollars over the next ten years to organiz- organizations, and quote dedicated to ensuring racial equality, social justice, and greater access to education. So I mean, like I said, there's a lot of stuff if you look up of what he's done in the background. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, the Quinn's on, like I said, is it enough, not enough? Um, he, like I said, I think they talk, he talked about in the documentary, people always say it's not enough. Um, uh, I, it is what it is, per se. Obviously, we, we, we are, like I said, he's worth $2.1 billion. How do you feel about that versus, you know, where's the cutoff line of how much money you can make before you're supposed to do what you need to do? Um, like I said, Cameron the only one remembers that. I do remember it being a huge ordeal. Um, it was interesting growing up with that. And whatnot else, which kind of leads to, I guess, the last part of... Which I will say, at least, like, from, like, listening to him, like, talk about it, like, a little bit, it do- I don't want to say, like, he's, like, 100% changed his tune, but I do think he... I think he realizes that he should have spoke up at those times, at least mm-hmm. a little bit. But I also, like, I don't know, I guess just, like, looking back on him, like, I didn't realize how young he was, yeah. like, at a lot of this stuff. And I think it's... Right. I think it's really hard to it well, it's easy for us to push somebody without realizing what other things are going through and just like ha- like when you flip it and you look at like it, it, i think the last dance does, does a good job of showing the other types of pressures that were going on mm-hmm. but i mean also much different time right like they're yeah. not i mean they're, they're getting like micromanaged with everything they do but not to the extent like now right like right. lebron does something for Taco Tuesday, and it's immediately like on the internet, right? Like we right. didn't hear about gambling stuff and things like that, or uh, yeah. everything else until maybe like a little bit later. Mm-hmm. So it's just like a different time period. So maybe he does do a whole bunch of stuff, but or he did a whole bunch of stuff. We just don't know that wasn't what about it. Focused but on also, right like there. his his influence itself is like more than most people can do with that the same kind of things. So. I don't know. I mean, right. he's probably just don't. He probably does more with his two billion dollars than most billionaires do with their billions of dollars, just by like right. the very fact that he's influenced so many people to do anything. Yeah. Right. And that's uh, why I've never really liked when people will comment and say like he's like, and specifically the Michael Jordan, not just like any athlete. I don't like when they talk about like well they don't do enough. I'm like, well, what like can we talk about the stuff that they do? do like name something that they've done like philanth- with their philanthropy and. Like they can say nothing, but then when like you re- we can research it now. So like, who's to say that we don't know everything that they were doing back then? Because you're right. Like LeBron can say can tweet out and say, "I'm going to donate one hundred thousand dollars over the next two years to these organizations," and blah blah blah. And we know that instantly. Whereas like this is the '90s. No one like and again like Kate to your point, I agree. Like he was young at that time. I don't think if I was 23 and someone told me like make a huge you know great political statement on something on this very serious thing that everyone can be proud of i'm like that's a lot of pressure to put on someone but and he was I just, also taking care of his family and everything too right like in a... yeah he said, it's, it's more I, complex it's interesting yeah and obviously i do think obviously i like to bring up the money portion because we talk about like you know what are you doing with your money and stuff and i'm not gonna say he was poor at any of these times but like i said He's not even making four million dollars until nineteen ninety. Uh, you know, a season. To right. the, obviously, he's worth a lot more money. But like I said, there are soccer players and there are basketball players right now that in one contract will probably make more money than what he made his. You know, in a season and what he made in like the first mm-hmm. ten years of his career. And not saying he's not rich doing anything, but like the level of what we pay athletes today versus even in the nineties is like almost three times, four times differently. And so, and then obviously you add in disparity of like people, you know, you could do a lot if you're on 40K in the 90s, but you can't do a lot in 40K right now. And so there does lead into this thing of like how we treat athletes in general of like, we don't care if they make a million because I'm still living okay. But now that they make a million and I'm living like, you know, crap, um, I, you know, what are you doing? And right. the only thing he should have done with his money 
was give some of it to Scotty Pippen because that dude <laughs> got <laughs> juiced. Oh, poor Scotty. I would give my money to Scotty Pippen. Like, here, dude, here's here's a hundred grand. Thanks. So if you ever, or if you ever win the, the lottery, you just be like, check to Scotty Pippen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, thank you for being number two in literally every category. Yeah, Scotty doesn't yeah. get enough of his dues. He really doesn't. You know why? Because Scotty had two years and he did nothing, and then he failed with the Rockets when they all went for the first trio. Um, fair or not fair, <laughs> but that's sadly how it got looked at. Um, yeah. Yeah, Scotty Pippen probably be a, could be a whole other episode because it, there's just so many hard things of like, what if you're like almost the second best player of all time? But the problem is the best player of all time <laughs> plays on your team. <laughs> so you'll never be the best of your team. Well, I, so real quick thing, I don't know if they're going to touch on this. I always think about this because Michael Jordan has three kids. He has two sons and one daughter. I always think about like, could you imagine your father being known as the greatest basketball player of all time? And y'all, like, how do you like... So thinking of Scotty being number two, I'm like, I could not, I wouldn't even want to pick up a basketball, I think, because there's just like so much pressure to be as good as him, if not better. I would just what like, happens if you're Michael Jordan's kid and you suck? So Michael Jordan's kid didn't <laughs> suck, do? but they weren't good. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't, Man, they weren't great. It's the same but thing. So they greatness is good? not genetic is what you're saying. Put it this way, his greatness got enough to where I believe he played college basketball or football. I think it was UCF, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, um, obviously, he got him. He got him close, but not that close. Not that close at all. No. And the daughter didn't play any sports at all. No. I don't blame um, her. Yeah, but no, the Scotty Pippen thing has always been fascinated. Um, the the craziest thing I remember about the Scotty Pippen thing is they announced, uh, which I thought I had in here, but anyway, the uh, basically the 50th anniversary of the NBA. They did the all time greatest NBA 50th anniversary team, and obviously both Jordan and Pippen are on this team as the 50 greatest players in the NBA. But everybody just kind of forgets that Scotty Pippen's on this team, kind of just thing because like you see it and you're like, I don't get you, it. Are you <laughs> supposed don't. to be here, Scotty? Like Jordan's here. What are you doing here? <laughs> And it's just kind of like, it's hard to gauge, like, because remember the jokes I about give it. give Scotty a hug. Because, like, it's just hard to gauge, like I said, how good are you, Scotty Pippen, versus, you know, how much did Jordan, like said, for all we know, Scotty Pippen could be the second best player in the NBA in the entire they, history, but we will never know because he wasn't even the best player on his team. I mean, they took yeah. him to the playoffs the year he, that first year he took off. They did okay. Yeah, but they didn't make the finals. They didn't destroy <laughs> they didn't everybody. They didn't make the finals, like, the these first things of his career either. It's it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. But yeah. Um, but it's kind of moves. <laughs> as much as that, uh, kind of the last part of which we think is basically for any hyper competitive person and does everything, um, he's an asshole. Um, it comes with a cost. He wasn't very liked by his teammates. Um, obviously, we saw some stuff in The Last Dance. We had the book. Came out. Um, the best part I know we talked about, like you know, did he punch Will Purdue? And obviously, you know, we see some stuff with Horace Grant, which is hilarious, by the way. And some yes. of the clips, whether it's mean or not, you know, he bullied an entire player out of the league. I don't care. But the thing that I find that's most interesting about this is Jerry Stackhouse. I don't know if any of y'all know who Jerry Stackhouse is. He's probably like a borderline All Star, maybe an All Star team every now and then. You know, whatever. For that Wizards team, you know, he was supposed to be the head star of the Wizards, and then Jordan comes back, and Jerry Stackhouse has talked about like. I grew up loving Michael Jordan. He was my favorite player, and he was the greatest thing. And then he played two years with Michael Jordan and the Wizards, and he's like, it's one of the biggest regrets he ever had in the fact that he hates Michael Jordan, and it ruined every image and everything he ever thought about Michael Jordan. <laughs> Don't meet your heroes. The dude, sorry. <laughs> the dude punched Steve Kerr in the face. <laughs> <laughs> dude bullied little Steve Kerr. I mean, Steve Kerr isn't little, but like... But Steve Kerr earned his wings, by the way. Thank you very much. Steve Kerr stood up to Steve him. Kerr in the face. So... I want to... I would have missed that three on purpose. Steve Kerr <laughs> was a little bitch. But no, bitch. like he stood up. Like I said, obviously we have the the extreme case of stuff, but like I, I always think of the Jerry Stackhouse one because he's literally a person, grew up childhood hero. Like I'm in the NBA because of you, Mike, and I get to play by you. And two years going, I wish I never met you. You <laughs> ruined every image I had, and my entire childhood was a lie. <laughs> I just um some of the other. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like you have to know, like, if you grew up with Michael Jordan being your hero, he, I don't know, maybe I won't give him that. But I'm like, I, if, I, if I had to play on a team with Michael Jordan, I would expect that this man is an asshole. 
I know, like, extent. it was crazy. I've been surrounded by competitive people my entire life. I've been that competitive person. Yeah. All of us are not Same. very great people when we're in competition. No. So, like, I don't know how you expect somebody to be, like, nice and butterflies when, like, <laughs> crap has to get done. They're so not the funny thing teams. about this. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I'll say the funny thing about the Jerry Stackhouse. They didn't deserve though. to be punched in the face. I mean, sometimes but... they probably do. But, I mean, it, trust me, you probably do. Will Purdue sucked. Um... He did suck. Um, but no, but the Jerry Stackhouse thing, like, we already knew all this stuff. Like, even by the time this happened, 2001, like, I remember all this stuff co- growing up as a child and everything, and so I, I knew stuff, because I remember seeing, like, the stories, reports of, like, they would do, like, half-court shot competitions, and then Michael Jordan would lose, and Michael Jordan says, no, we're not leaving, and I'm not getting on the bus until I make a half-court <laughs> shot. And and they would just sit there, all of them, until Michael Jordan could make a half-court shot. And then they would finally get on the thing and leave. Um, like I said, how much... You know what? The sad part is that could be totally made up, but that is something I totally believe happened. And then... <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, but, no, like... Anybody that's ever been in, co- in competition, especially at the highest of levels and everything, especially when you were at the farthest of levels, which why well, I, I do appreciate The Last Dance and what it did, whether it showed them or whatever, but, like that level you have to get to and what you do and the drive and as Kata said the tenacity yeah. of being around. I'm with kinda of like the thing of like, Jerry Stackhouse, what were you doing your whole life, man? You didn't you thought Michael Jordan was like your BFF just high five? No, nah, <laughs> he was gonna punch you if you missed that three pointer. He thought he was a role model. <laughs> <laughs> but like I say this is like again having played basketball for like a almost you know, not a majority, but like a big chunk of my life. But like in just any sport when you're being competitive I feel like there are people. There's those people. There's those those people who are assholes on teams, and I feel like as long as you can back it up, as long as you're actually doing your part and doing yeah. your work, and you don't suck, and you're not being you know a dick to everyone, and you're the one bringing the team down, I can get over it. I can shake it off after yeah. practice, and if, as long as you're not being an asshole off the court to me, I can shake it off. But like, it, it for me. You saw how much Michael Jordan works and puts, he sweats and he wants to be the best. And no one, you could, I feel like no one can also say they worked as hard as him, but I will say that his attitude probably made people work harder. So Jerry Stackhouse, I'm just like, I don't know what he expected. Nisha, like, Nisha I, 10 out of 10 was punching her, her teammates in the face, <laughs> for sure. I actually got hit in the back of the head <laughs> once in practice, and I did not take it seriously, but I was pissed. And the girl's like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's fine. Let's just run it back. Let's go. Like, and then she's like, you were just being so mean to me. I'm like, you literally hit me in the back of the head and I shook it off. <laughs> Let's just practice. So my, my dad was like, not the best person to be on the sidelines. Cause like my dad is hyper competitive. And like the only reason my dad didn't play college football is cause he got injured right before. But like, so when he put me in lacrosse, so like when I was playing girls lacrosse, I was just a lot better than like the other girls on my team. Cause I had spent a year playing boys lacrosse. So, like, I was I was just conditioned very differently, mm. and I made one of my defenders cry because she missed a block, and I got laid out, and I made her cry, and the coach took me out, and my dad, like, got really mad and told the coach, I guess you let losers on your team, and then he got <laughs> removed from the, <laughs> from the thing. Which, and if you, Adrian's met my dad. Matt has met my dad. My mm. dad is a quiet man. Who does not say much unless it has to do with sports. <laughs> and then he says a lot. But then, like, but when I flip it, too, because, like, I've been the asshole who has been super competitive and I'm going to try and force everybody around me to be as hardworking as I am to get this thing. And it's not great a lot of the times. But at the same time, that's why a lot of, like, that's why, like, success happens because you mm-hmm. have somebody pushing everybody forward. But I've also been, like, when I did my year in guys lacrosse, I got, I got treated like crap. Mm -hmm. And it it wasn't even that I was a girl. I was, like, I was physically weaker. I was, I was slower. And the same two guys that crapped on me every single practice to push me to get harder, they were also the two guys that came with me in the mornings to work out and then showed up at the end of the day to work out with me again. Mm -hmm. So, like, that, like when you're in that spot to me, like, I, I, I just see something that is naturally competitive, especially in sports. Like, that mm-hmm. stuff's gonna happen. And that's right. why that's why people succeed a lot of the times. Like I'm I, going to work this year, and when my teachers, my mentor, or my mentee that I have this year, 
isn't stepping it up. I'm just going to punch him right in the face. <laughs> like, look. Look, dude. Step teach better. And I'm just going to punch him. To be him, honest, if, we punch, right if we punch more people in the face, we'd solve a lot of our problems in the society. Um, <laughs> yeah. What I did when I trained my people as a TA, I'd let them do something by themselves without telling them anything. And then they'd, like, do things wrong. And I'd be like, okay, this is everything you did wrong. You're going to learn to do it right now. Yeah. Um, but, no, like, it is interesting to see. And, like I said, obviously we talked about all this, you know, the hyper competitiveness and it's just crazy of just how much we got from him and we've seen it in other athletes in general but it definitely is certain it's a certain personality and it does drive success and it does get you to push to overcome things and you do you know there are people that you know sometimes you just gotta hit them in the face and see if they punch you back and you'll be surprised you know those are the people you want on your team i always think you know, of them more i i definitely want somebody on a team that would punch me back yeah. You know what? It's respect. Yeah, it is. Um, said, if you can't punch me back and you cry, I don't want you. If you hit me back, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do this. That's probably a we got very deranged thinking, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, you you know, oh, I, I, so Matt, Matt may be actually talking about punching. I'm just talking about if I throw something hard at you. I'm not going to punch you. <laughs> and I think that, like, I think that any sort of teamwork capacity – there is always room for pushing back on somebody, yes. especially when they're pushing you hard. But you just have to understand that when somebody's coming at you hard, you have to have the backup. Like you have to have a reason to push back, and you have mm-hmm. to come, you have to come back at that person just as just as much. Yeah, yeah. Because no, now you get walked on. I also like I also grew up my mom telling me a ninety three wasn't good enough, so I probably so, got my own issues. So I always think of the, the competitive. Range. So I always think of the thing of obviously this is kind of much as competitive and other stuff of like just talent and how you upset, especially in the best of players of Maurice Corette. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ohio State when you're freshman, shown the NFL, still robbed University of Miami of the national title. You don't deserve that, Ohio State. That was a bad call by the referee, but. Um, Essentially, he obviously, and I think he finally ended up in jail. Um, he was stuff and everything bad. But, like, they talked about Jim Trestle and everything, talked about of, like, sometimes on your team, you need the crazy person. You need the person who's just willing to, like, just punch people in the face and the hyper-talented, and you accept that because it helps, whether it motivates, whether it leads, or whether it does something, like, you need the people that are willing to get dirty to, to you know, to move forward. Like, because if everybody's just a nice guy, you're just going to all play around, high-five each other, but nobody's doing the work. Nobody's pushing you to get better. Nobody yeah. challenged you in any way. And if everything you, you do... You can't have two Michael Jordans on a team, though. Oh, God, no. Not in fast, <laughs> Not in fast. But no, but like I said, but like I said, you need to, like you need to give and take, and obviously that's probably also why Scottie Pippen takes. As, it's also probably why Scottie Pippen takes as much shit as he does, because in the day Scottie Pippen played that complimentary role, whether he needed it or not. But Scottie Pippen could have been the be- you know, the, the second best player in the NBA history, the biggest alpha dog in the world, but he wasn't better than Michael Jordan, and so he would have never, they would have never coincided. And you know what? If he probably would have stepped up, Michael Jordan probably would have squashed him. He probably would have yeah. traded him to the division rival just to beat him. But, you know, it was just seeing that type of level, like I said, that mentality. And like I said, it's obviously not the most healthy. It makes you the nicest person in the world. It definitely probably don't want to go hang out all the time. Apparently you want to go party with them. That's all I've learned from watching these people. You know, they have a great time. But, you know, you need those people to move forward, and you need those people to get to the top. Like, we think of a lot of teams, and like, just if you think over the years of all the teams, there's usually always one player that you're like, oh. Guy's probably a little out there, mm-hmm. but we need that player. Like, there's a reason Michael Jordan chased Crazy Dennis Rodman around Las Vegas to go find him at like four in the morning, because you needed Dennis Rodman to go play this game. Um, but no, yeah. obviously, like I said, um, there's probably a lot of stuff. I do think the last dance, whether it paints him bad light or not, um, definitely got a lot of respect. Um, like I said, being hyper competitive myself, it. It's nice, and I see why people want to be like Michael, and I see, you know, you can see the toxic effects, but I I just see more people just like, I'm just going to lay down and quit, and it just drives me crazy so much worse. I hate that. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Adrian, I know you've been pretty quiet, but I know you also played sports. Were you a puncher, or? (laughs) No, I was much more of a... I was much more of like Scottie Pippen that that year that they went to the playoffs. Uh, I was... Because I was always like... Especially like in football, I was always like a uh, team captain, but I don't like getting yelled at. So why am I going to go? I, I don't want to go yell at people. Uh, oh. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, we kind of had like a four horseman thing kind of going on, and I was definitely not the uh, the yelly guy. I was the guy that if you yelled at me, we're doing Oklahoma drills until you stop being an <laughs> asshole. So I guess technically I hit people, but it was legal because it was in the drill. Dang. An Oklahoma drill, if you're not familiar with, is like one guy has the ball, one guy doesn't, and then you just hit each other. And gotcha. I rarely yeah. lost those. <laughs> so maybe that's why people didn't give me give me a lot of stuff. You know, you, maybe that's why Steve Kerr. I never had a Steve Kerr moment because many people knew that I would put you in the room. I'm telling you, if you punch them and then somebody gets their wings, it is about. It feels so good. So, You're so happy well, for them. But- to Adrian's point, I do think that that's also, like, an important part of, like, competitiveness, even if you aren't, like, because obviously, Adrian, you know me and Matt, we're both loud. Misha, obviously a loud one. But, yeah. like, you just said, like, okay, yell at me. Okay, let's go one-on-one here, and let's hit each other, and who th- who gets up? <laughs> like, who, like, that, that that's pretty much the same thing, only minus the, minus yelling. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I mean, yeah, that's, that's probably that's probably the difference. I never because you watch because when you watch the last dance, like he's legitimately like yelling at people, calling yes, them like yes. an asshole, and like and that's that's definitely not me. Like I'm not gonna yes. berate you. I'm just gonna show you that I'm a better football player than you are. Which uh, has its merit and is essentially doing the exact same thing. One yes. is just emotional, and one is physical. <laughs> I'm not gonna emotionally scar you. I'm just gonna physically scar you. Exactly. <laughs> but you're gonna but be I, great. <laughs> I, I just think that like I. I like, obviously, there is toxicity in, in competitiveness, but I do think that when you look at, like, great players, people who get to success get to where they need to or, or like, mm-hmm. push harder. Or even when you just look at how people grow up, like, I don't really know that many people who weren't taught to, like, at least compete with themselves in situations. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't know, like, I, I just feel like competition for me, like, that was ingrained in me from, like, the like. The moment I brought home an A, B, and my mom saw that Hannah in my first grade brought home an A, was when I realized that I needed to be the best at what I did. <laughs> so. No, like, I do love the self-motivation stuff. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, except as a runner, I guess. I know, Nisha, you obviously run stuff. I don't know if you've run, like, actual, like, races. And I mean, not necessarily compete at a high level, but, you know, just kind of like a adult, like, I can compete type level. Yeah. But anybody, at least from, obviously, as being a runner, you know, between running, you know, 5K, 10Ks, half marathons and whatnot, I haven't got the full one or whatever. But, you know, like, you eventually need that competing, at least for me, that competing drive to, like, and that, you know, that mental, I guess, toughness to, like, not only just compete against your, like, compete against yourself, but compete against your body to keep moving. And I guess, like, it's yep. weird, because I, like, I, that was one of my favorite parts in stuff he talked about, you know, doing stuff to, you know, get himself in, because when you do, like, a running, you don't have people, you know, people just, dr- I know we tell stories, but 99% of the time, people drive by the, drive by you, you know, throw a Coke can at you or something, you know, you're not having something to motivate you run. Right. Factor, other than your own will, your own drive. Matt's punching himself in the face <laughs> as he's running. <laughs> I mean, I've ran before and said, "Man, look at you! You're a little bitch. Can you I not mean, move faster? What are you doing?" Like Matt is the kind of person who definitely started rumors about himself so that he could overcome <laughs> those rumors that he started. Well, because running at a certain point becomes a mental game more than a physical game. Yeah, I get that. I mean, like for me. I'm five, all of five foot four, and I remember being like a freshman in high school, and this one girl on my team started rumor. She's like, she's never gonna make varsity. So like for me, like com- like I became that's when like competitiveness really clicked for me. I've always been competitive, but I was like, I'm gonna prove this, I'm gonna prove her wrong. So like my mom and dad learned that like what motivates me is people telling me what I can't do, people telling me like you will never yeah. do this or you'll never do that, and it makes me work ten times harder. And like I tore, I've tore my ACL twice from playing basketball. And I still played all throughout college. And my whole thing was that because that one girl one time saying that I would never play in college was my motivation to prove her wrong. And I did it. So I get being hyper competitive. Like it has its ups and downs, but like it helps people achieve what they need to do. Um, no, I mean, obviously, as, I guess as we kind of get into like before we get to the fun fact, but you know, like you need that drive, that stuff. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Obviously, I know people hate uh, the emotion anger and, like, do everything else, but, like, anger's gotten more stuff done than any other emotion. <laughs> and a lot of the drive and stuff comes through, like, this person was mean to me. What can we do to prove this person wrong? Um, but, so I Matt, guess before... you're not supposed to fight what you hate. Oh, I will always fight what I hate. Y'all can... 
Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I'm about to go real Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I took that personally right now. And <laughs> um, So I guess to get out of here with some fun facts where we kind of get out of here. I know we've ran a little long, but also like, you know, there's a lot to cover and we think uh, a few fun facts. Obviously, his number 23 is clearly retired by North Carolina. We think it the, the Chicago Bulls, but it's also randomly retired by the Miami Heat. Um, what? Yes, the Miami Heat retired uh, the number 23 when Michael Jordan retired as well. That's why LeBron, when he played for the Heat, did not wear number 23. Um, but it was, I, I don't know. The Heat are stupid. Uh, they're my favorite team, and I like them. And, I, you know, since Eddie Jones and Alonzo Mourning and them and Tim Hardaway, but Ugh. for some reason, I don't know if they just, like, got tired of losing all the time when they were good, and they decided we're just going to retire as number two. Um, he's also the only player to win a scoring title and Defensive Player of the Year in the same year. Um, which people think about, cause especially nowadays, where you're like, oh, look at the defensive player of the year. He, you know, usually a big man most of the time, and basically, uh, you know, like Ben Wallace. He got a bunch of rebounds, but Ben Wallace couldn't make a jump shot to save his life. Um, hey, you leave Ben Wallace out of this, <laughs> all right? You leave Ben Wallace out of this. I love the Ben this. Wallace shade. I will, <laughs> I will not take any Ben Wallace sl- slander. Um, as he, well. Because while homeboy's playing with the Wizards, Ben Wallace is winning championships, okay? Oh, all right? Yeah. Obviously, we talked about Like Mike, the movie where somebody stole his shoes and became Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan once wore number 12 because someone stole his jersey before a game. Clearly, that ch- person did not become Michael Jordan and didn't work, but that did happen. See, that's how movies write themselves. Um, at one time, and found this fascinating that at one time he had a stretch where he recorded 10 triple doubles in 11 games. Um, for those of you who don't know what triple double means, essentially, you get basically like. 10 plus or double digits in three categories um it's common depending on where you what position you play but you know how it does you know when you're averaging 30 points and still doing it what nothing but no like obviously all went over my head is what i'm trying to say (laughs) yeah um but no it's thing obviously russell westbrook and we've gotten more as we've gotten more offensive uh game in the nba but you know at time in the stretch especially for what it was um fun fact his divorce cost him 168 million dollars and the funny thing is it's only the second highest in sports history um the first being 300 million dollars by chelsea uh football club owner roman Abramovich. Abramovich. i don't know anyways he got divorced and it cost him 300 million dollars you ever want to type a podcast on how women rob athletes? There we go, because there's some big nummy in there. Never seen so many freaking like hundred million dollar stuff. Next, um, don't you yell at me? They did a whole entire thirty for thirty on this. Yeah, um, punch you in the steal head. All your money. <laughs> they did a whole. Eddie Murphy did a whole entire skit in the eighties on this. Um, Next. Um, <laughs> Let's go. Right I am. He, uh, he did. He did actually gra- get his degree in cultural geography and from uh, North Carolina in 1986. Two years. He went back and did it. Um, Air Jordans were originally made, and obviously, like I said earlier, were originally made just for him until 1985, where they were done in the public. And then actually, what was called the Nike Airship was actually, which was technically supposed to be like the one of the first public things, um, was actually banned by the NBA because of the quote unquote 51 percent rule which basically meant all shoes had to be at least 51% white for them to be okay to play in. And apparently this rule actually was in was around to the late 2000s, surprisingly. So that's why you always have the white uh, basketball shoes. Um, obviously, the ban- this band was using promotional material saying, like, this shoe was so bad, the NBA wouldn't- was giving Michael Jordan an unfair advantage, which led to the Air Jordan 1s, which maybe that's why everybody thought they got great stuff with the shoes, but they would have used the marketing banned by the NBA. That's how you get the Air Jordan 1. Um, I asked Nisha about the commercials because apparently he had a local TV show in 1989 called the Michael Jordan Airwaves. <laughs> Never Obviously, saw it. didn't last long. I don't even know if it's good. For all we know, it's just Michael Jordan yelling about his teammates for like an hour every night. I don't know. <laughs> um, he put an American flag over the Reebok logo when he played for Team USA out of respect for Nike. Because um, he couldn't be showing that Reebok logo that you know, uh, the, um, you know that they had. And then from basically from November of 1990 all the way until basically he retired, all the way until basically he retired, uh, Michael Jordan teams never lost three games in a row. And this included basically 500 plus regular season games and 126 playoff games. Damn. And then kind of to Adrian, when we talk about the Wizard year, he's actually the only player over the age of 40 to ever average 20 points a game and above. He averaged What's 22. What's the sample size for that? How many people are playing? 
I don't know. That's Apparently, 40. he averaged twenty-two and twenty. That's more than a lot of career averages for players. <laughs> he did it Kobe? at forty. Yeah. Kobe barely was getting like twenty uh, points in a game in his last year or so. Oh, that's right. Okay, this, this is true. <laughs> the downhill drop for basketball players is very bad, and that's why. Yeah, the downhill it, drop for like basically any athlete over forty is. Yeah, but basketball ridiculous. players is really bad because once they lose their legs. It's just done. And it's like a quick, like, one year, uh, you better retire, you're going to look bad. Yeah. Um, Which is why he's only 57. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that's all I have. Kate, I guess, take us out. I know we're running late. Take us out of here. Yeah. Uh, So thank you, Nisha, for coming on uh, and helping us with your Chicago-adjacent knowledge. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for um, having me. why Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? You can find me and my Chicago Jason Knowledge on Twitter at LA underscore NEY underscore SHA. And anytime y'all want to listen to me and Kate talk about anime, head over to Did You Have To. Awesome. Cool. And with that, if you listen to this and you want to support the show a little bit more so we don't go around punching people in the heads, head on over to patreon.com slash butwideopc. Uh, and you can find us on all of our social media at ButWhyTheOPC, and you can find me at OmaMethRandier on Twitter. Adrian. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at SuperUs93, S-U-P-E-R-R-U-S-E, 93. Matt? I'm still sad that John Stockton never won an NBA Finals. <laughs> <laughs>